Welcome to another morning coffee with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews. Today's Friday, another fantastic day. It's still dark out. One thing that, that I do really like is that the days are getting longer. And that's one great thing about uh, winter is that when you work your way to spring and summer, the days get longer. So I'm really excited about that. It makes me excited because one thing about living in a, a climate zone where it has multiple seasons is that you can really appreciate when you have nice weather. Uh, some people don't like the heat sometimes, that's, that's fine, but I really enjoy that, you know, you go into fall, it's a nice season for sure. You get into winter, can be bitter <laughs> sometimes. It's not so bad. You can get used to it. But then it's when you get into the spring and, you know, everything starts to grow and everything turns green and everything comes to life. If you garden, I do a lot of gardening. Um, you know, you start to see plants start to grow and then you get into the, to the warm months and, and it's fantastic. You know, you you get long days, you know, it's sun's up at five and it goes down at like nine, eight thirty or nine. So you got a long day compared to the super short days in the winter. So there's so many things to be grateful of having multiple seasons. It's tough going into, <laughs> into the winter and stuff like that, but coming out of it, there's so much gratitude that I have and it makes you feel good about uh, where you live for sure. How's everyone doing this morning? Quite Doing well. Great. Good morning, Trevor. Good morning. Good morning. So it's uh, it's still quite early, right, for for a lot of people. But uh, yeah, t t this week's been a, a fantastic week. I got uh, a lot accomplished, and more and more stuff coming coming in. Uh, you got a lot of big goals, and I you can see. Um, I'm working my way through the weeds right now as a business owner and entrepreneur because there's a lot of different things you need to know about when you just you, when you have a, a a job or a career you know you go you go to your job and you crush your job and you know and you can leave and come home a lot of times depending on your role don't get me wrong and then you can separate from it and what I'm been practicing even since I started my refrigeration mentor business is that I've been trying and practicing on separating my work life and my business life because it was even hard as a technician in the field definitely real hard as a technician in the field because I just go out and work all day and I come home and talk about refrigeration all night when I'm hanging out with my buddies uh, so it was hard to separate that even and then when I work for a manufacturer the same thing I was always trying to improve get better and just focus on you know building better courses or having a better pitch and, and things like that. And now since I'm owning my own business, being an entrepreneur, I'm trying to separate and I am separating like my work life and my business life my because you need to have some sort of work life balance. If you don't, it's going to lead to a lot of stress and pressure on you. Uh, well, and then some people that just, you know, they just live on, you know, working, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what that is your life and that's what you want to do, I say that's great. You know, because I see people like they're all, well, why are you working so much? You know, why don't you go out and doing something and have fun? Well, no, that's what you like doing. Like when I like and when I'm working, I like working what I'm doing. Lots of people don't like what they're doing. That's why they're saying, why are you working 24 hours a day? Why do you work seven days a week? Well, it's probably because they like, maybe they like to it, maybe they don't. Um, but I know when I get into my work more, I really enjoy it. There's some times that I'm sitting and making videos or building content or having conversations like this is that I can get right into it. There's so many times that I'm sitting down doing the training and I could just keep talking for another two hours. You know, but <laughs> when you're doing, when you're training, educating people, like some people, you need to get, take some time to absorb information. And for me, do, making that separation between work uh, and business life has been uh, very helpful. So if you're someone that works all the time and you love it, great. But if you, if you know you're stressed out because of work a lot and you know, you're always on, say if you do a job where you're on the computer a lot or you do a job and you're out in the field a lot and you need a break, well, you, gotta take, you need to recharge. 
you know, you, there's some people that just can go and go. You still need to get sleep and you still need to get rest. But there's some people that just can consistently go without really taking breaks. Most, most of the other people, you do need to take a downtime. You need to take an electronics break. You know, I see this a lot now. It's like uh, even big influencers, you'll see that where they'll just, they'll have stuff pre-made for the stuff for that week they're going to be off, but then just really shut it down to try to just take a break um, because you do need that sometimes. And it's important to do that and do the things that you love as well. You, if you're doing all this hard work and working in the field or uh, building a business or whatever you're doing, you, you, there, you should be doing it for something. Maybe it's you're putting all the hard work in now and you're spending 10 years not spending any money and you're busting your ass off because you know that in the future you don't have to you're not going to have to work so hard you know and that's what people don't understand is like if you you know well why are you working so hard why are you not going out and having fun and spending money on this or you know going out to eat all the time well because they got a goal maybe maybe they're focused on getting their shit done now and getting it done and spending the time putting the time in, putting the years in now not doing anything not going anywhere and being hermits because they know from 50 to 80 that they're going to have you know a lot of financial freedom maybe get to do the things they want build something that they love and that they can help others grow and this is what i see a lot of entrepreneurs really good entrepreneurs what i'll what will happen is they'll they'll start out maybe small and then they'll start to grow and then the stresses change you know it's not about uh making the money because maybe the money is coming in it's about how do i help others keep their job make more money, build and grow? And how do they can help them be successful? Because a lot of successful people that I know, they want to help other people be successful just like them. You know, so if you're a really successful entrepreneur and you can make 10 or 15 successful people or 20 successful people, how does that help your business? And how does that that feel to that person as well? Because if you can help someone, you know, work, uh, for you and they can live the life and career and have what they want in their life. Cause not everybody wants to do the entrepreneurship. It's not, it's not super easy. Everybody would do it. Everybody would have their own business um, if it was super easier. So it is, it can be difficult, but just make sure that you take the time uh, to recharge your batteries when you need to try to split the work, have a work life balance. If that's something that you, you want, and it may take time may take a couple of years, might not happen overnight, but you got to work on things like that. Arshin, how's it going, man? Back again today. Like seeing that. Good morning. Uh, yes, third day in a row. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that. See, this, that's the beginning of a habit, right? <laughs> that's the beginning of a habit. That was good to get a good habit. Hopefully this is a good habit. I know Victor uh, been here almost every day, Joel, George, Lau for sure. I see more and more people stopping in and it's good. I really appreciate you guys taking the time and having conversations with me. Hopefully you're getting stuff out of it. And if not, hopefully you're just enjoying watching me to have a drink of coffee, I guess. <laughs> um, so I've been working on, yesterday I sent you guys uh, in the chat um, the link to a lot of the E2 and CPC stuff. And I was, I dove into it a little bit yesterday and what's really good about having that resource is that it really helps out when you're looking for information, speeds up the, the process of finding it because yes, you can go to Google and my, my go-to is to go to Google. I think I said this before, write in a manufacturer's name or the component's name on anything that I'm searching for and then uh, write what I'm looking for. So if it's like, uh, Bitzer CO2 transcritical compressor, I'd write Bitzer CO2 transcritical compressor. And then I would look down through the list and try to find PDF from Bitzer uh, that would relate to it. And then I would click on that and then I would review and just kind of check in the title. Is that the one I'm looking for? The transcritical uh, application engineering bulletin or their technical bulletin. But you really need to go to that, find that source as well, because there's a lot of times where you'll go and you'll click on it and it's like, uh, manual downloads and it's from a different site it's not from uh, the manufacturer site and don't get me wrong like you could do that but it's not that from the main source so it could be an old manual 
it might not be the most up to date. And maybe that's what you're looking for. Cause I've had that happen a lot where I went and looked for a manual and I'd find the revision 10 and, I, and they're on revision 17. So there could be a lot of different information that has changed over time that you need to know about because you're installing maybe a newer compressor or things like that. So be aware when you're doing research and finding these technical manuals that you're getting it from the right sources. And like that E2 or CPC one is a good example where it's a lot of their latest information. Like I said yesterday, it's, it's not all their, all their documents. Like it is a resource where you find there's quite a few of them and there's a lot there. So it takes the time to go through it. But this is how you plan and prepare uh, when you're doing jobs, or when you're on service, right? Taking the time to uh, research before you go to the job, understand where to find that information. If it's Danfoss information, well, you should know how to find it on your phone if you only have a phone. If you're not bringing a tablet with you or a computer with you. So you should have bookmarking that stuff Make it easier for you. So you don't have to spend that four or five minutes searching at Google first and find a link and then go to the website and then start looking. You need to start bookmarking that stuff in your phone and start to organize it a bit. You know, and that's something that I'm still working on beyond being organized is something that has not been uh, super easy for me, but I know I can get better at it. And I am getting better at it. I can even tell like the way. I first started using a computer. Like I used, I started in the nineties. I had a computer. I was a lucky, I was very lucky uh, that I had a computer in the nineties. Um, my parents didn't have a lot of money, but they, they got us a computer and I can't remember how it happened. So I kind of knew what it was all about. I didn't really start learning. And in our high school, we had some, we had a computer class, you know, that was a big thing in the mid nineties where you had a computer class and you can type on the stuff and it goes on the screen. And it's like, wow, and, uh, but I haven't really started using a computer only the last, I'll say 10 years. I used it in university and college and trade school, but it, I didn't spend, I didn't work on a computer. It was just, I had to do assignments. I had to do write-ups. And now it's over the last 10, 15 years, I've been using it quite uh, a bit, but I've never been really organized. You know, I never used the bookmark bar until the last four or five years and understand how to organize the bookmark bar and what to put in there, like organize it maybe by manufacturer, then manufacturer name and then technical bulletins and brochures, whatever it is, learning how to break that down to find the information easier. Because over time I have seen where I've had so much documents and I wasn't being organized and I, it took me a, a longer to look for it on my computer than go on to Google and find it again and redownload it. So that's an issue, you know, you're running into organization issues when you have uh, documents on your computer and you still have to go to Google to find that document you already downloaded. So just be aware of that. When you do, uh, but when you do find that document, you should be logging on your phone, set up like a little uh, folder system. You know, there's apps out there uh, and where you put the resources for those different pieces of equipment that you work on. Maybe it's just a package unit. You work on a lot of the same package units but they have different components in there. I highly recommend making yourself your own uh, binder inside your phone. Like it's a, it's a electronic document, but so if you have certain uh, solenoid valves, okay? So if it's from Sporlin, it's a specific one, you should have that in this specific folder for the specific uh, package unit. Just say it's a, a York or a carrier, it doesn't even matter. And so, oh, they got this electronic board and then maybe it's from White Rogers or whoever it's from or Honeywell. A economizer. So you get the economizer uh, manual, put it in there. So all the different parts. So if there's a compressor, if it's Copeland or train or whatever, have it in this one folder for that specific uh, piece of equipment. And then when you make another piece of equipment, maybe you have that document saved in two places. So that it's not like you don't have a lot of space anymore. There's a lot of space. Maybe some people have, don't have as many gigs on their phone, but if you have an Android, I'm pretty sure that you can add more gigs. So over time, it, save up some money and buy it, an extra chip and put it in the phone and get some more data on your phone or have a, a location like um, OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever to save these documents. So there's different ways to do it. And maybe even some free apps to start mm -hmm. building these documents for yourself. And that's going to help. Uh, wow, uh, what's happening? I was going to say, Trevor, uh, that uh, I have a Google Drive 
and a OneDrive. So Microsoft and from Google, I have some files yep. and then I have them labeled, you know, service controls, uh, heating or refrigeration. Uh, and then I have a, I do have actual physical binder sometimes for um, stuff I'll pick up on a job site. I know sometimes I'll run into smoke detectors and they'll, they'll be, you know, really old water damaged papers, but I'll, I'll grab that that way. I, I know that no one's using that and uh, I'll take that, put that in my binder. Other, other materials sometimes I run into, sometimes at Supply House, they'll actually have good resources. I just um, was in a Supply House yesterday and they had some Sporling material and TXV, TXV. So I, I grow those, grab those and th those will go in the binder now. Awesome. Yeah. And, that, and that's what it's, uh, you continue to build your library. I remember in my van, if I was moving companies or, or moving vans or vehicles, I would have crates. Like I, said, I work in supermarkets, so you got, there's lots of milk crates. And I'd have three or four of these milk crates full of a library, you know, and just started to continue to build and build and have them. You know, did I use them enough? No, <laughs> for sure. They sat there more than, they, than I, I should have been looking at them. But those times that I ran into an issue, I had them there. And it was a little bit different because there wasn't really cell phones. You know, it wasn't like you can go jump on Google on your phone now and look up the resources. And it depends on how you like to learn. Maybe you like to have the paper. Doc I do like having paper documents because then I can highlight and circle stuff. I do the same thing in... Uh, on my phone now as I get better and better at it, but it's important to do that. Build yourself a library and it makes it easier. Like if you do it organized. Yeah, manufacturer apps are another great resource, you know, for those specs and info. So Lau, you got your mic working now. It's been like three weeks. Now you get a mic. Is that right? Did I hear you Lau? Maybe not. Okay, yeah, so that's something important to do. Start building yourself a library. And so it makes it easier for you to troubleshoot and look for stuff up. Anybody have any questions? Anything burning desire before the weekend starts? We do this tomorrow again. Have you had a day yet, um, Trevor, where you went over uh, oil and oil return? Uh, sometimes I just sometimes try to get into more of the deeper understanding of how uh, you know oil return works in the refrigeration system. Okay, yeah, no, regardless that's... regardless of the size. Yeah, so the biggest thing, and there's quite a few big things. It all goes back to the design. Okay, the design of the system and the piping. A lot of times in the supermarket uh, side of it, the manufacturers, depending on the manufacturers, will have a schedule and you want to follow that schedule. Could there be mistakes on it? Maybe, but I've done a lot of jobs where I've installed a lot of pipe and I just followed the schedule and it was fine and follow the manufacturer's information. But for oil issues, it could be a, quite a few different things. So if you're just in a single unit, say a refrigeration unit, you got a compressor and you got an evaporator and you got a condenser, or you got a, sorry, condensing unit and you got an evaporator. One thing you need to make sure is you have the right line size. You need to have the right slope. You need to have the right traps. Uh, you may need a double riser, right? So if it's an unloading compressor, if it's a variable speed on it, if it's a digital compressor, how low does it unload? And what's the velocity and the mass flow at that point? Because these are things that are very important. Uh, was there enough oil added at the beginning? You know, did you, when you did the commissioning, did, was there enough oil in that system? Okay, and these are the things that you really need to look at. And just because that system been running for two years, don't assume that it was installed properly or it had enough oil in two years. You, you got to take a look. You got to figure that out. If it, there's a site glass, it makes it a lot easier to see how much is in the compressor, but it doesn't make it easier to figure out where that oil is, depending on the system. So you got to check 
Is it sloping back to the compressor? Do I have the proper traps? Is the size of that suction line correct? What is my pressure drop? Am I short cycling? All these different things can lead to uh, oil issues. Is the strainer's plug, is it an oil pot? Is that those like strainer's plug? Is the filter dryer plug, oil filter dryer? Or is there something plugging in the system? Is it a low temp system? How cold is that coil? Is defrost working? Because if defrost is not working, you need to, what happens to, I'll ask you this question. What happens to oil when it gets really cold and low temp? Does it get thicker or thinner? I'd imagine it should get thinner. I mean, thicker. Yeah, yeah, thicker. So below zero degrees, it starts at 32 uh, Fahrenheit, oh, sorry, zero Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius. I think I got to get my, my numbers better, but it starts to turn like molasses, right? So you need to have a defrost at some point to pull it back on low temp system. Because how is it coming back? Because you got at that point really no mass flow. And you need to get it back some of it. So these are the things that you need to think about when you're looking at a system. So there's, I just talked about six or seven, maybe eight different things that, to look at. And if you, if you don't take the time to understand that, then that's when you're, okay, well, I'll get it working. You know, if it was short cycling on a bunch, you'll figure out maybe, okay, let's figure out how to get it to stop short cycle. Maybe it's oversized. Maybe you have to add a drive on it. Maybe you have to change the compressor. Maybe you have to change the whole condensing unit because it's way oversized. These are the things that you need to look at. Uh, Check-in velocity. One thing as a, uh, as a technician when I was in the field, that's something I didn't do very often. I was lucky to be on construction sites with some very smart um, for, uh, foremen who were just a few years older than me, to be honest with you. And we would stop if there, we ran into an issue or we had to add an extra unit. All of a sudden, uh, we're doing a construction site. Well, well, we need another unit over here. We're adding this to the rack. And then you know the manufacturers, the engineers would say, okay, well, we got enough load on there. This is the here. So we would have to um, you know, do the line size. And well, they would do it and they, they showed me how to do it and I walked through it. So I had understood it kind of on that, like uh, that refrigeration piping guide that I said to you guys a few days ago. Yes, Lau, thicker viscosity change greatly, 100%. So these are the different things that you need to understand. So it takes a little bit of time. Another thing people don't think about, but and if you talk to an oil separator manufacturer is that all of a sudden, if you change the temperature of that refrigerant coming down back to the, back to the unit, back to the rack, you know, if it, that oil's too cold, that separator is not going to separate or uh, separate either. You know, if it's too hot, it's not going to really separate either, either. So these are the different things that you really need to, to think about. Because if you take a system and all of a sudden you take that refrigerant and you drop the temperature. And so now your head pressure is not as high in your compressor. And that temperature of that oil leaving the, the discharge line, hitting that separator is not is super cold. Well, maybe it's not separating the, the amount it's supposed to. So these are the different things. So I 100% would follow up and ask questions to uh, Westermeyer, Temprite, all these manufacturers that do oil. Like there's some great, great guys that I've talked to, Adam Chapman from Westermeyer, like so helpful. He'll answer all your questions there. Go to their website. Uh, when you're running into types of oil issues with oil management systems, for example. Sporland, same thing. They got lots of great information. They do more of the oil products, not like separators and stuff. I think they may have they may have oil separator reservoir. I have to double check. I can't remember, but uh, Emerson does too. They have a few separator reservoir. But you need to understand um, these different oil things. And oil is one of the hardest things. George, to figure out sometimes, to be honest with you, trying to figure out why, where's the oil at? Why is it not here? And then some, a lot of people just will start pumping oil in. Okay, I don't have it here, I, I pump it in. Well, maybe you might have to do that. Don't get me wrong. You might have to put oil in to get it running, but you got to sit there and figure out where's the rest of the oil. Is there a leak? Did I walk around and check every single part? If there's no leak, where's the oil? Like you're playing, where in the world's Carmen San Diego? <laughs> Hey, Trevor. Joel, what's up, man? I'm good, I'm good. Sometimes with oil, what sometimes, you know, could be some main problems and 
think many technicians, refrigeration technicians, supermarket will, will encounter that is sometimes um, they take out fans, take out the fans, let me say like in the freezers or the chillers or the prep rooms and the, and the circuits are still, refrigeration is still running. And we know that oil migrates to the coolest place. So sometimes when they do this kind of stuff, and sometimes you come, you see controls trip. And you know, most times you ask, hey, what's going on here? Sometimes you might come and the fans on and but sometimes that's be the instance where they might have taken off for a little few minutes. And that's mostly be sometimes some common problems, especially with oil migration. You know, so that is something to keep in mind sometimes. Yeah. Also, yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. And so it could be lots of different things. And the big thing is happening while you're not there. You no know, floodbacks. Another one. You have a bunch of liquid refrigerant coming back. You just wash out that compressor, washing the oil right out of the out of the compressor. And then if you have an oil failure control, hopefully it shuts it off. But if you don't have an oil failure control, it's just gonna take out that compressor a lot quicker. Because a lot of times I've seen it, and I've even done it in the field, to be honest, as I didn't understand it enough. When I go into a service call um, and the compressor's tripped off, number two compressor's tripped off, and you look inside and there's no oil in there. Well, where did the oil go? And then, you know, you, you check around. You never want to reset uh, components right away. You want to look around first because, and you want to check if there's oil in the compressor, if it has a, if it has a sight glass, because if you press that and you're full of oil and it's full of liquid refrigerant you press the reset button on a Centronix and product three uh core sense protection core sense uh, uh diagnostics or whatever oil failure control you have it could be a, a danfoss one or a pen one it doesn't matter you press the reset button and you have way too much oil way too much refrigerant there what do you think might happen probably going to take a slug and maybe blow the head gasket so this is why it's important to visually inspect stuff so if you look inside and all of a sudden there's no oil in the compressor, well, what happened? Was something stopping it from entering? For an example, was the, the filter plugged up? Was the oil pot screen plugged up? Was the, the oil separator ball uh, gummed up? Or was it liquid refrigerant came back and just washed it right out? You know, so these are different things you need to think about. And writing stuff down is so important. That's why you take notes and you just say, okay, assess everything first. Don't go in and shoot, be shooting by the hip. You need to assess everything that's going on. And that's where, you know, you, you take a, a, separate a good technician from a great technician. You know, that, you know, they'll take the time to take all these notes, write it down. Maybe it's in their head. Maybe they're not physically writing it down, but they understand each step, the process to think about. We just talked about their oil issues. There was a lot of things that I mentioned that could cause an oil issue. So you, you, you can't skip, skip any steps. Okay, does it have an inverted trap? Is that, where's the longest uh, run? You know, you could look at that. Okay, well, I know um, oil moves really good with liquid refrigerant, but it doesn't move as well as with uh, suction gas. So what's the size of the suction line? Was it piped right? What, is there a pressure drop? You know, all these little different things. Does it have an oil management system? Doesn't it? You know, on the smaller systems, it's quite a bit more difficult, right? Because you don't have a site class. But there's a ways to check, you know, check the temperature of the compressor, check the temperature of the sump. You know, is that return gas temperature coming back okay, but the compressor is super hot in the sump where the oil should be? Well, maybe you should look into that a little bit more. Why is it super, that super hot? It's the mechanical damage in the compressor. Is there no oil in there? These are some of the things that you need to think about. What is the true definition of oil logging in the evaporator? Uh, to be honest, Lau, I don't know how to answer that, but uh, oil can log in an evaporator quite a few different ways. One could be from temperature, like I talked about. If you don't have that defrost and all of a sudden it starts to uh, log up in there. If you don't have the right oil in there, just for an example, if you have uh, mineral and POE oil mixed with a POE oil refrigerant, it may just log right in there. and It's not going to carry it. it may log, be logging into condenser as well. Um, also if you don't have the proper traps, so all of a sudden you just have a 90 coming out and going up 10 feet, that, that oil can't be, uh, wicked up. It can't be pulled up 
by velocity. Maybe the suction line is too big and it's not, or, or maybe it's not sloped back to the compressor, it's sloped back to the evaporator. So it's when the compressor shuts off, it starts to fill up the, the evaporator. So I don't know the true definition of it would be uh, the evaporator is full of oil. You need to pump the system down, pump the circuit down safely, shut it off and uh, maybe take a, a drill and drill a hole in, in the evaporator to drain it and then fix the piping if it's piped incorrectly. Unfortunate to reset one oil pressure control, Centronic replace one oil pressure control unit. I've seen a lot of people, and I may have even done it in the past, I don't remember, but I've seen a lot of people uh, replace Centronics, oil failure controls, uh, oil safety controls um, that weren't that weren't the problem. You know, you get a control, you go put it in, all of a sudden it still doesn't work. Uh, so be aware that you need to check these controls and understand how they work, right? Because it could be something as easy as the gasket's not on the, the sensor that's supposed to be inside the, the compressor. When you replace compressors and condensing unit, how can you tell that the system has proper oil level without a site class? Ah, I love that question. As I didn't know this until, until the time I worked at Copeland and those gurus taught me a lot. And uh, when I was there, uh, what you need to do anytime you have a compressor that fails or that you cut out, maybe the compressor is still running. Maybe it's the, the compressor, there's nothing wrong with the compressor. You may have to pump the system down, cut the compressor out and tilt it upside down and fill up a measuring cup and actually measure how many ounces or how many liters of oil is in that compressor or milliliters, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, you have to measure the oil and then compare it to what the, the compressor manufacturer says. So inside that compressor, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, they, it's about four per 5% maybe difference, five to 10%, because you'll see on compressors, they'll have a, a factory charge. So compressors they sell to OEMs is gonna have a specific charge. And then service compressors that you'll buy from a supplier or a wholesaler or a distributor, they'll have a less of a charge because the compressor manufacturers know that there's already oil in the condenser, in the evaporator, in the pipe. So you don't need as much oil in the replacement compressor. But you as a technician need to measure that oil when it comes out because where's the oil at? This is where I've seen it happen multiple times with four technicians out there. Okay, compressor fails because the oil is logging in the evaporator. Okay, so the first one fails because it's seized, we'll say. And then they replace that compressor. Don't check the oil, put the next compressor in. That one runs for a little bit. All of a sudden, that one may be seized. Okay. So they pull that one out and put a third one compressor. They put that new compressor in, and then all that oil comes back, and then bam, you got a smash compressor. <laughs> so now you got three failed compressors. And the reason is, is that maybe the piping was the issue the whole time and it was logging, and then all of a sudden it came back, maybe with a defrost, who knows what, and caused that compressor to, to damage in a different way. So these are different things that you need to think of, but that's a great question. You need to measure the oil if you don't have a site class, you know? Okay, 703, I wanna thank all of you again for spending some time with me today and uh, let's do it all again tomorrow. Let's get a conversation going. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Trevor.